Okay. We are in part three of our series called Sharing Bread from Heaven. It is uh, part three out of ten on the subject of evangelism. And um, in part one, a couple weeks ago, I, I gave a message just about that before we, it's even doing a piece of religion, like evangelism, this piece of religion that we do as Christians, that it's really simply about sharing good news. That sharing something good in your life, in fact, it's the best thing in your life, which is a relationship with the true and living God through His Son, Jesus. And then last week, in part two, I gave you a message to say that you know, there's so many of us that we feel that, like, I have to have everything put together. I have to know more Bible. I'm not a good enough Christian. I can't tell anybody else about Jesus because, because I'll blow it. And um, one of the things I wanted to share with you last week was share with them your deep and transparent humanity. Share with them your weakness. Share with them your vulnerability. And when they see that you're a real hurting person just like them, then maybe they'll also see that there's someone there with you in the hurt, and his name is Christ the Lord. Right? Today, um, I, I, I want to give you a message, which I hope that many of you will in some way go consider a no-duh kind of message, um, but I hope that it will, it, will, it will help you nonetheless, which is that before we even do any kind of religion-y Christian thing to anybody called evangelism, that before we are even doing evangelism, you know what you're really doing? What you really should be doing for a person when you evangelize them is really you're loving them. <laughs> That's what we're talking about today. That, and maybe if you're saying, I'm not even sure how to tell somebody about Jesus, maybe we should just start by saying, maybe I should just learn how to love somebody. <laughs> One of the reasons why I think we're Christians were bad <laughs> And sharing the gospel with other people, or maybe we're just uh, scared and nervous about it, is simply because we just don't love people. <laughs> well, we don't love them enough um, to give them this great thing that we have, which is a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus. And that's really what I want to talk about today. And I thought that the place that would say it the best in the scripture is this really profound place. So I get to preach to you this incredibly famous passage. And of course, I can't you know, hit on everything. And we're going to talk from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 today. And so in three parts, part one, the center of Christianity, not a noisy gong, okay? That's what you want to share with people, the center of the center of Christianity, as opposed to being a noisy gong, all right? Part two, um, the problems of non-Christians, or let me put a little subtitle to this, why you have lots and lots of opportunities to love them. Love people that don't know Jesus, okay? Uh, they have problems. I know that to, to you think, you have, I, I have um, these co-workers. My cousins don't believe in Jesus. And they look like th their life is all put together. You know, but, but actually, um, they have problems. Or if they don't have them right now, they will very soon. You have lots of opportunities to love them. Right? And part three, um, a lot of us, because we think about evangelism as some act, a duty, something, some performance that we have to do onto others, that's actually, I want to pro propose to you, that's actually a form of childishness. It's spiritual childishness. That's what the passage says. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. But when I became a, a man, I put away childish things. And I want to talk about what does it mean? Part three is growing out of spiritual childishness. How to really grow into spiritual manhood. Okay? So let's get at it. Um, part one, the center of Christianity, not a noisy gong. Um, you know, it, this, uh, b before I, I, I get into this, I don't know if many of you probably, heard, you know, when you went to a wedding, that people love saying this at a wedding. You know, love, is, you know, love is patient, love is kind. Um, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong. <laughs> I'm a clashing cymbal. That's the way it starts. And usually you go to weddings and you hear this thing and it's very, you know, it's, you know, it's all so romantic because you're at a wedding and everybody, you know, they go, oh, that's, that's such a wonderful passage. And lots of people 
who don't go to church, you know, people go to, go to weddings, and, um, and of course non-Christians get invited to weddings, and they're like, wow, that's in the Bible? That's a really cool passage. And it's set in the context of all this romance in weddings, but that's not what the passage is about, okay? <laughs> that is not what the passage is about. The passage is not about romance. It's not all like lovey-dovey, it's kind. Actually, the very beginning of the passage is a punch in the face. You know, do you understand that? It's saying that if you can speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but you don't love, you are a noisy gong. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that junk. And I think that is about as good a way, as, as an unbelievably great application to bad evangelism. If you know the Bible and you can be slick, you've got all your arguments, you've got, you, you, you know what to say and you, you're really good at what you're going to say, you're a great theologian, you can talk better than the pastor, all this stuff, and you say this stuff to your friend, to your non-Christian friend, to your co-worker, whoever it is that you want to share the gospel with, but you don't have love, you're just a noisy gong. <laughs> okay? And guess what? That's why we don't want to share the gospel, because we're doing this activity to them, and they, we already know they don't want to hear it. And then when we do this thing, so we do this thing, we're going to do this evangelism on them, they're going to be like, Ugh. why? Because we're a gong. <laughs> we're a kush, and a kush, and a you know, like, because nobody wants to hear that. But let me, let me propose to you, just this, this is, in a, in, a, in a sense, this is the sermon in the nutshell, but if you have love, you will not be a noisy gong. Hmm? You're going to say something to them that, They'll, they'll be interested in it. Or at the very least, they'll say, I'm not sure if that's for me, but I'm, 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 I'm glad you said that to me. I'm glad you shared something about your life, your faith. Hmm? So, you know, so much of the beginning portion of this, these first verses is about this. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, do you have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge? Like, wow, I don't. But wouldn't that be amazing if you did? But then he goes on to say, uh, but if you do not have love, I am nothing. <laughs> That'd be amazing. If you met a person with prophetic powers and can understand all mysteries and have knowledge, some of you really respect me because you know I have... I have great knowledge. And some of you respect me, and you're like, that's why I like this church, because, because Pastor Susan knows stuff that's like mysterious. He studied the Bible. I mean, gosh, he has serious knowledge. But actually, if I didn't really love you, if I didn't really have love in me, then I'm really nothing. <laughs> That's not my opinion. That's the infallible word of God. I am nothing, nothing. Okay? And that's what this pastor is saying. Most of us, we want to gird ourselves with some kind of like, some kind of righteousness and some kind of spiritual power and some special thing that will say, now I'm ready to share about Jesus. If I have this then maybe someone would actually listen to me if I said something to them about my faith. But actually, you're wrong. What you really just simply need is genuine love. And that's the title of the message. Um, let me read to you a, a passage from this book. Uh, I, I read this book. I, I got it recently. I just stumbled upon it. I heard, uh, I heard this guy on the radio, and I had no idea that he was a Christian. Um, and he said, my book just came out, and so um, his name is Andrew, Andrew Clavin, or I don't even know how to pronounce his name, K-L-A-V-A-N, and he says, my book just came out, and it's called The Great, it's not even a Christian radio program, but he said, my book just came out, and he says, it's The Great Good Thing, and the subtitle is, A Secular Jew Comes to Faith in Christ. I said, really? You know, I, I love hearing stories about how people that you wouldn't normally think could be, would become a Christian, 
secular Jewish people, I mean, that, they're probably near the bottom of the list of people that you would expect to become a, a Christian. And so um, that, that got me intrigued. So I got the book and I, I finished it. It's awesome. <laughs> it's, if, so if you like stories like that, and oh gosh, he can write. And by the way, if you don't know who he is, I, I didn't know who he is. He's a, he's a best-selling author. And movies have been made about his, um, about his books. So apparently he wrote a book called True Crime, and Clint Eastwood was directed that movie. So now I want to go see that movie because apparently he wrote that book. Okay, so, um, but the, 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 the book is a deeply honest and, um, tale of how he came to the Lord. But um, I just want to share this, this very important portion, which is relevant to today's message. Um, this is what he shared. Uh, one of the people that was important in his life that helped him come to faith. So he had numerous different um, you know, influences that helped him come to faith. Um, and it took a long time, by the way. <laughs> this guy didn't become a Christian. Like the first said, would you come to church with me? And then he came to church and he said, oh, I need Jesus. And then you, it, didn't, it, was nothing, it didn't happen like that. <laughs> it was a long, hard journey for this guy to come to faith in Jesus. Um, and, and, uh, but one of the people that was important was a couple and the guy was actually a pastor. He's an Episcopal, Episcopal pastor. They call him actually in the, in, the, in the Episcopal church. They call their pastors priests. He's an Episcopal priest. And, um, and uh, his name is Doug Ousley. And he's in New York City. And his wife is named Mary. And so he says, somewhere around this time, I met Doug Ousley, the rector. The rector, that means is the pastor of the landmark Episcopal Church of the Incarnation. So that's the Episcopal Church of the Incarnation, um, and apparently, you know, that, that they have a good pastor there, you know, um, um, around the corner from my apartment. So this is in, in New York City. Um, this is the pastor who would one day baptize me. But when he met him, I mean, it was it was years and years and years before the guy finally baptized him. Okay, and it says his wife had been playing with her babies on the balcony of the of the of the church. And notice my wife playing with her baby in the garden below. The two mothers became acquainted after Ellen, that's the name of his wife, Andrew Clavin's name is Ellen, and met Mary. Mary is, uh, is uh, Doug Ashley's wife. Um, after Ellen gave Mary a copy of my Transfiguration poem, we all got together. That's really interesting. So a non-Christian, but his wife, by the way, at this point, um, Ellen, is an atheist. <laughs> And, um, and at various portions of his life, Andrew Clavin was interested in Christianity just purely from an intellectual perspective because the guy likes stories and he loves reading um, some of the best literature. And one of the things he realized is all the great li literature, at least in the West, when you get down to it, somewhere along the line, it's been influenced by Christianity. And so uh, he wanted to learn about Christianity. In fact, um, his father was virulently, virulently anti-Christian because in his mind, um, Europeans are all Christians and the Christians committed the Holocaust. And so his father hated Christianity, absolutely hated Christianity. And when he was a teenager, he just wanted to know something about Christianity because all the books he liked, he realized had something had been somewhere along the line had been influenced by Christianity. So he actually got himself a copy of the Bible, which he didn't own because he's, he's Jewish. And he got himself a copy of the Bible and his father caught him reading the Gospel of Mark and his father went absolutely berserk. So that, this is to give you an idea of, of, of his background. Um, but he had, he had read the Bible. I mean, the guy had read the whole Bible when he was a teenager. Purely out of intellectual um, curiosity. And then when he grew older, he's a writer. He actually wrote a poem. Um, he actually wrote a poem about the transfiguration of Christ. Isn't that weird? <laughs> he's an atheist. Secular Jewish. And he wrote a poem about the transfiguration of Christ. His wife gave that poem to the pastor's wife. And that started a friendship. So let me just say a little something about this. 
there are people in your life. Externally, they look as absolutely resistant to Christianity as you can possibly think. But somewhere in some weird little corner of their life, they have some connection, some interest, some in the past to Jesus. And if they share it with you, wow, that, that's like they're just sticking it on a platter for you to love them with Christ. And that's exactly what this couple did. The Owsleys were a comically mismatched couple. That's how he describes them. She, the, she is delightfully vivacious. He is phlegmatic, taciturn, and mordant. I told you he's a good writer. Doug was a dedicated pastor who spent a lot of his time sitting be beside sick beds and tending to his parishioners in their emergency needs. But I sometimes used to tease him that he was the worst priest ever <laughs> because he was gruff and sardonic. That means he had this kind of like a, he had a little bit of a, a nasty little edge <laughs> to, to a sarcastic sense of humor. That's what sardonic is. So if you don't know, that's, I love, I'm kind of that way, I mean, if you noticed, okay? <laughs> so as soon as he described him as gruff and sardonic, I was like, ah, oh, I like this guy, <laughs> right? And, um, and he did not have any of the stagey warmth or bone of me most pastors cultivate. That's, that's kind of like, you know, young is like warm, and I'm a little more this, like this, okay? A little sardonic, a little bit of a little, I have a little twist of my sense of humor. I'm a little more twisted, okay? Um, in short, he was my kind of guy. <laughs> and we became close friends. So this guy liked this pastor because he was a gruff kind of guy. <laughs> It was good and helpful to talk religion with Doug Owsley as I tried to reason things through. He was widely read and carefully reasonable, and he never preached at me. Sometimes I even attended services at, you know, the Church of the Incarnation, to hear his sermons and to enjoy the Bach cantatas sung by his excellent choir, which included his wife Mary, who was a former professional singer. Wow, okay, so... If you like choir music, it must be good. But really, listen to this, and here's the part that I want you to get. Really, it was the capacity for love behind his brusque exterior that gave his faith substance for me. Not his preaching. It was his capacity for love that gave his faith substance for me. And then later on he goes to say specifically his love for his wife over the increasingly terrible years. I was walking in our neighborhood one day and met Mary on the sidewalk outside the post office. I gave her a friendly hello, and without prologue, she fell sobbing into my arms. So remember what I told you last week as a Christian? Share your weakness. That's exactly what this pastor's wife did. She knows he's an atheist, but he's a friend, and they had dinner together. And then when she saw him, before, she didn't even say a word, she just started sobbing in his arms. Uh, as, I, as I stood nonplussed and uncomprehending, she told me her foot had gone numb. I patted her back, there, there, and said it was probably nothing. It was not nothing. It was an early symptom of multiple sclerosis. Over the next 25 years, the disease killed that vital and affectionate woman by unbearable inches. And Doug never wavered in his devotion to her, never faltered in his, in his love. It was a tough guy performance for the ages, because he likes tough guys. <laughs> and he would not have been able to do it had he not been steeled by faith in Christ. It was a living sermon. His best. So, I'm telling you to love your non-Christian friends, but it wasn't even the pastor's love for him, Andrew Clavin, that won him over. Of course, that started a friendship which enabled him to actually have a real relationship with Doug Ousley, but it was seeing Doug's love for his wife. It wasn't even his love for him. <laughs> it was his love toward his wife who was weak and frail and hurting. And of course, he was weak and frail and hurting. Just seeing the love 
was a powerful, powerful draw to making the gospel a real and, and, and compelling thing for him. See? Now, um, I want to say a few things about this, a couple things. Um, the center of Christianity is this. It's not institutionalized religion. It's not prophecy. It's not, it's not miracles. The center of Christianity is real and genuine love. That's the center of Christianity. You know why? Because the Bible says God is love. The only Christianity banks everything on love. I don't know if you know this. It isn't Buddhism. It is not Islam. Islam is an almighty God. Islam is about a God who has absolute power over everything. That's what makes God great in Islam. Almighty power. But actually, of course, we also believe that God has almighty power. But that is not why we sing to Him. At the center of Christianity is not God's almighty power. At the center of Christianity is His love. It's so important that the Bible even says God is love. And I don't know if you understand this, that it's part of why we believe in a holy trinity. That God is one God, but here this is something mysterious. That it's three persons, and what is important about these three persons? That from all eternity, before there was anything ever, from the beginning to the end, if there is such a thing, before there was anything in history, uh, from all eternity into, into all eternity, those three persons have had perfect love for one another. That is what makes him, what is what makes our God compelling and beautiful, is love. So if you are going to share about our God, because that's what sharing the gospel is, that's ultimately it's good news about our God. You want to share about the true God, who is our God, to your friend, you know what should be in there? Love. <laughs> you should love your friend. Because if you share about Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit to your friend, but there's no love in it, you're just going to be noise. <laughs> you're really actually undermining Christianity. <laughs> because if you want to share Christianity, at the center of the center of Christianity is an absolutely undefeatable love, who is God himself. That is Christianity. And so, how about having love? And it, it isn't even, this is so amazing to me when I read this. It isn't even love to the person. Now, of course, we want, we want to love that person. But if you really even just love your wife, love your neighbor, you know what? They will notice. They will notice. The capacity for love was the, was the profound witness if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I am nothing. That's the way the scriptures put it. Um, let me say one more thing before I go to the second portion of my, uh, of, of my, of, of, of my, of my uh, message today. Many of us think, I don't have a feeling of love for my coworker. So how can I love him because I don't have any feelings of love for him? Um, well, let me say to you, you don't have to have any feelings of love for your coworker. You don't even have to like them. <laughs> um, this customer regularly comes to my shop and I don't even like her, okay? Um, you don't even have to have a feeling of love because that is the wrong, see that's our secular 21st century sentimental, that's that syrupy, you know, foolish understanding of love that you get when you go to a wedding, not, not the actual punch in the face from the Bible. <laughs> love is an action. Do you notice? Love is patient. You don't have to have any feelings, good fuzzy feelings toward the other person. It helps, but you can be patient to them. Love is kind. Love is kindness toward them. It's, it's an intentional, I'm going to be kind. I'm going to foster up kindness, and then I'm going to give you kindness. That's love. <clears throat> love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. I hope that when you meet with the person that you want to share about with Jesus, you know, that he doesn't see you day in, day out, being arrogant or rude, looking down upon them. 
No wonder so many of us, so, you know, today, there's so many people who think Christians, we're the ones who have the right religions. They all have false religion. We're the only ones who have the right morality. They have false morality. So we look down on them. <laughs> so then, of course, then they think that we're arrogant and we're rude. <laughs> but do you notice real love isn't like that? Right from the Bible. Not Susan's opinion. From the Bible. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. These are actions. <laughs> These are things that we do. <laughs> Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and it doesn't end. Wow. That's love. It's an action. It's, a, it's an intentional something that we foster to give to somebody else. Okay? So, not noisy gong, but let's go to the center of Christianity and share that with our friends and our, our relatives and our co-workers. Um, part two. Um, the problems of non-Christians... There, there are, I, I, like, you know, many of you are probably thinking, like, I, 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 there's my cousin, like, my cousin, you know, completely doesn't, doesn't um, my cousin makes more money than me, my cousin's better looking than me, my cousin has a nicer girlfriend than me, my cousin is happier than me, I'm a little bit of an angry, depressed person, but my cousin is a cheerful person. <laughs> my cousin has utterly no interest in Jesus. My, my, my cousin is just, you know, if you ask him, what do you believe about God, he'll just say, I, I'm a nothing. I'm a nothing, or I, 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 maybe I'm, I'm a Catholic, but you know he's not really a Catholic, he's just a nothing. <laughs> right? He never goes to church. Right? The only time he, he you know, maybe he like kind of crossed himself, he doesn't really believe in anything. Right? God is just like some distant figure to him at, at best, maybe. So you know people like this, we all do. And we have this idea that they won't be interested at all about anything that we share, or they won't care, or they'll just think we're weird if you ever invite them to church, or even mention God, or even pray in front of them, or ask to pray for them. And so we're embarrassed to do all these things because we don't think they have problems. That is not true. It is so not true. <laughs> That's just the front that they put on. Don't you put on a front? When you go to work, do you tell everybody about your problems? Don't you just try to act like a happy person? You dress well, you comb your hair well, you do your makeup well, you know, you, you put on your cologne. Don't you act like, like I, I'm a good person, I'm a happy person, I've got it all together. That's just their fake facade, just like you and I have. <laughs> okay? Be and that's not, of course, 100% of the time. Sometimes they actually don't have problems, but just wait. <laughs> okay? So let me just share with you some of the things that I have, uh, that I've noticed about non-Christians. And this is on my mind all the time. By the way, this is on my mind with you too, <laughs> with my members. So you show up at church, you put on your facade, I'm gonna put on my christian facade, and I'm just like, yeah, they're, they're, they're whatever. <laughs> the one of the reasons why you, you, you listen to me as a preacher is because I kind of get past that facade and I kind of like say things like, this is what you're going through. And they're like, how did he know that? How do you know that's what you're going through? And I just kind of go right into it. Because I know you're going through stuff. But so are they. Now let me just share with you a few things that non-Christians are going through. If you're a Christian and you regularly follow the Lord, and you especially go to church, and you have brothers and sisters, and even if you're not a very good Christian, do you know you have so much more than they do? You're, you're kind of a, I'm one of those really lame Christians and I get drunk a little too often. I'm a little too angry. I look at porn sometimes. I go to church about once every other week. I barely know the Bible, but I, I, I actually really do believe in Jesus. You're one of these kind of Christians, which I know a number of you think you are, right? You have so much more than your non-Christian friend. I mean, you're like, you have so much more than them. <laughs> Okay? I mean, I'm not trying to get you to go around like looking at all your knockers. Oh, I pity you. <laughs> I pity you. But really, we should. <laughs> because you do. You have so much more than that. So let, let me just, just, just break down some of it. Number one, they lack wisdom. They lack wisdom. 
You know, I lack wisdom. Okay, no, they, like, they really lack wisdom. Okay. They don't even know what's right and what's wrong. Okay, it's called, in, in our culture, it's called relativism. And people around us, they really believe in relativism. They really do. That's why they could, you know, they could cheat on their taxes or steal from their boss or lie to their friends or, have fill, or be filled with unforgiveness and hatred toward their father. But uh, I'm a good person <laughs> because they're relativists. They think they can just pick up some girl and sleep with her and because she doesn't complain, I'm a good person. <laughs> They don't even know what's right from wrong, okay? People who don't even know what's right from wrong don't have wisdom. It's just a matter of time before they hurt themselves. In fact, they may be hurting themselves regularly. They're blind. They're a blind person walking into a dark room, and guess what? If you were blind and you walked into a dark room because it's dark, anyway, you're blind, you know what happened? You would hurt yourself. <laughs> That's their life. <laughs> That's their whole life. Now, some of them have wisdom, and some of them know what's right and from wrong, so it's not like they completely don't know what's right from wrong. A relativist doesn't know nothing, of course, but, but they have key, key blindnesses. And there's something else. Because they also don't have wisdom, they don't have resources for the chaos. We all have things like fear, shame, insecurity, anger, Resentment, sadness, maybe a sadness that's so powerful that like the only way that we deal with it is just it's like drinking too much. Um, they don't have wisdom and resources for this. And um, you should know that. And they need to be loved. <laughs> that's, that's just one. <laughs> okay, that's one, okay? Um, it gets worse. <laughs> it gets worse. Number two, let me share. Okay. I now, whenever I meet a non-Christian, you know what I assume about them? I assume this. Now, it may not be true about all of them. I assume this now. When I meet a non-Christian, I just assume that they're lonely. Most non-Christians are lonely. Maybe not right at this exact moment, but they're lonely. Why? Because many of them lack deep and real friendships. They don't have a church. You go to church on a regular basis. You know when you show up, somebody's going to care about you. You may go to GLF, your art small groups, and you can tell, you know these people are safe. You can say, oh my gosh, I'm going through this really scared thing. I'm really scared. Huh. And they'll pray for you. You know that. You know some of these people will just invite you <laughs> to a dinner. You're not even especially very close to them, but they'll have a gathering. <laughs> Uh, for you know, they'll they'll have like a first birthday party for their baby, and they'll invite you. You're not even that close to them, but they invite you. Our non-Christian friends, they don't have this. They have like two drinking buddies and a couple of friends, and maybe they got a girlfriend. Those are the only people they really, really actually know in the city. And two of them they would never go to if they were in a bad place. One of them they think is totally unreliable. So they have maybe, maybe one person, maybe one person they would go to if they were in a hard place. And they don't have anybody to share their fears or their hurts or their angers with on a regular basis. But if you go to a, a good church, and in our church, in our church, you always have somebody to share with. <laughs> Anytime. You know there, you probably have, I hope, I hope you have at least two or three people in our church. You could call on a dime. I mean, you could just call them. Nine o'clock at night, you're feeling anxious. You could call somebody. You could at least call me. <laughs> you could call Pastor Young. You could call probably one of our wives. They don't have a pastor to do that. They don't have a friend to do that with. But you have a, a, a church family. And they're not just, you know, this is a strange thing. The people in your church, they're supposed to be your friends. So they actually try to be your friends. You know why? Because we're not even friends, we're brothers and sisters. We're bonded together more deeply than the blood of your family. We're bonded together by the blood of Jesus. 
Nobody can break that. We're bonded together forever and forever. So you may dislike somebody in church, but guess what? That's temporary. <laughs> You're like, I really hate this person's guts. Well, you know, you go to church, and, and at church, you know, we do this thing called the Lord's Supper, and we're not doing it today, but... You know, you're so, you, that, that thing before you come up, you're supposed to confess your sins and forgive that person before you come up and receive the body and bread of, of Jesus, and the body and blood of Jesus. You know that? So that you're in a group of people that is regularly seeking to forgive each other, love each other. We have this thing called the peace of Christ. And isn't it great? They don't have the peace of Christ. So they're lonely. So number one, they don't have wisdom. And they don't have resources for the chaos of their heart. Number two, they're lonely. And number three, if everything is going great right now, you're like, my industry is going great, and I'm making really good money, and I got a good, nice girlfriend, and you know, like we're having pretty good sex, and and um, and I'm I'm really healthy, and um, everything's just just going really great for me, and I love you know, and 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 the Niners are just you know kicking butt, and that's what I like to do on Sunday, you know, like if that's if that's your friend, that's all. Just just wait, <laughs> three months. Six months, a year, life is going to happen to them. <laughs> so this is one of the things that I've realized now about being a pastor. People show up with their facade and, and they're, I'm, I'm good, I'm good, you're good, I'm good, you're good. I just wait. <laughs> I preach the gospel to you and we do the best we can to love you and shepherd you. But it's just a matter of time before life happens to you. Um, it's a matter of time before their industry gets shipped off to China and they're going to lose their job. And this massive mortgage that's on top of their back, they're going to lose their house. That's going to happen. That's not, that's not a theory. That's going to happen to one of your friends in the near future. And of course, they don't have uh, wisdom, so guess what? But it's funny, they all want to get married, but they have this really romantically, like, you know, this delusional idea of marriage, you know, like, oh, you know, like, you know, happily ever after, so then they can get married, and then, guess what? They, they're, they're, they won't know how to do marriage. They're going to have marital problems. Um, and then, then they're going to have kids. <laughs> do you think they have wisdom to know how to raise their children? And they're going to, how do you do this? The whole thing, how do you do this? How do you do this? <laughs> That's what they're thinking all the time. How do you do this? Isn't that what you and I thought? When you had, when you had a baby, your child was a baby, isn't that what you're How do you do this? Well, wait till they be, well, the kid becomes a teenager. And the kid starts dropping F-bombs to you know, their face. How do you do this? I just want to strangle my kid. How do you do it? Life is happening to them. And of course, there's sickness, even death. Their father will pass away. Their sister will get cancer, or they will get cancer. And there's lots and lots. And then all of a sudden, their weak, vulnerable, frail humanity, their mortality will shine. And all of a sudden, this thing, uh, last year or two years ago, this Jesus thing just seems just like, it's, it's, it's a weak crutch that these religious people use. That's what they think in their mind. But all of a sudden, they look at you and realize, you know, I know, I know you're hurting. I know your sister has cancer. And it's hurting you. I know it's hurting you. But you have hope. Where does that come from? And somewhere along the line, if they know you, know, you believe in Jesus, they will connect the dot. And maybe if you and I will muster up the guts to invite them, you want to come to church with me? <laughs> maybe they'll say yes. Maybe they'll say yes. Love. Love them, please. Love them. Love these people who are lost without the wisdom of God, who are lonely without the family of God. They don't have the wisdom of God. They don't have the family of God. They don't have the comfort and presence of God when life starts kicking them hard. <laughs> so how will they get some of the comfort and presence of God? Through me and you. <laughs> Us. God's people. God's family. His church. His love them. Let me close this message 
Um, this passage says that when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. I, I think that is a spot on description for the way most of us think about evangelism. We think like a child, we talk like a child. But then he goes, but when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. You know what he's saying? This passage is, is, is about, you know, the Corinthian church was about, they were all about gifts and knowledge and prophecy and I'm the better Christian than you and who's a better Christian because they have more knowledge and they can pray better and all this other kinds of stuff. And what Paul, he wrote this, he wrote this to punch them in the face, to say, you stupid Corinthian church. You're so stupid, so childish. When I was a child, I put away childish ways. He's like, you're a child. That's what he's, he's accusing this church of being childish. You want to be a man? Do you want to be mature? It's love. It's better than tongues. It's better than prophecy. It's better than knowledge. It's better than talking like an angel. It's love. This, this is the deep thing. Um, I want to close with a, a, a couple passages from Andrew Clavin again. And then I'll say something. I'll tell you the gospel. I know it's close, right? Um, he says that uh, one of the things that really helped him, one of the things that, that really helped convince him, this is really, is that he, I mean, this is really interesting. He was an atheist, and unlike, unlike most atheists, he actually had a good marriage. And he realized that one of the most important things is that his wife was really truly loved him. His wife loved him like this. She loved him. She was an atheist, but she loved in a 1 Corinthians 4 through verse 7 kind of way. Love is patient, love is kind. She loved that way. But he goes, he, one of the things he started to realize is that the more and more he lived with his wife, he started to realize the thing that was really truly real in life was this thing, this love. Everything else was actually the phony thing. The real thing was love. This is the only real bankable thing in life. Here's the way we put it. Sex, birth, marriage, these bodies, this life, they were all just representations of the power that had created them. The power now surging through my wife in this flood of matter. So she's just a body with a flood of matter. But there's a power that's surging through her, always reaching me, and that's her love. But actually, it's not even just her love. It was a love. For, he, he realized in hindsight, her love was God's love. That all real and genuine love is coming from God. This power that was surging through my wife in this flood of matter, the power that had made us one, it was the power of love. Love, I saw now, was an exterior spiritual force. Remember, this guy, he, 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 for a while, he thought there was nothing spiritual. It was an exterior spiritual force that swept through our bodies in the symbolic forms of eros, then bound us materially skin and bone in their symbolic moment of birth. That's what he's talking about, marriage. Everything we were, everything we were going through, it was all merely living metaphor. Only the love was real. Okay, this is a little bit of, of, a, of a sophisticated point, but let me see if I can get this across to you. Most of us think that the stuff you can touch, this is the real stuff, and this idea of like love and like God, like that's like the not real stuff. And so the meta, this is the real thing, and that's sort of the thing that's kind of like the stuff that we always use as metaphor. He started to think, actually, the stuff that we can touch, that's the not real thing. And all this stuff that we experience that we can touch is just here so you can experience the real thing, which is love himself. God, if you experience God, you must experience love. And anytime there's ever real love coming into your life, that's God coming into your life. That's one thing he started realizing. This is the real thing. When he finally got saved, this is the way he put it. I knew now the irrational prejudice of the human mind. The belief that the symbols of reality are more real than the reality that they symbolize. <laughs> That's us all over. 
We believe that money is more valuable than the work that it represents. Isn't that interesting? That sex is more essential than the love that it expresses. That an actor is more admirable than the hero he portrays. Isn't that weird? Tom Cruise portrays some hero, and then over time, everybody loves Tom Cruise. But he's not anywhere as heroic as the guy that he actually portrayed. Like, Tom Cruise is the phony thing, you get it? Tom Cruise is the thing that's not real, but the heroism is the thing that's really, the thing that's really wonderful and real. We believe that flesh is more alive than the spirit. That's the whole nature of our delusional lives, the cause of so much of our misery. One by one, we let idolatry ruin each good thing. So there's all these good things, the money, the sex, the, the, the acting, the movies, and then we idolize all these things. They're the, not even the real thing. The real thing is the spiritual thing underneath it. Without faith, we can't help ourselves. We can no more see through our materialist prejudice. That's what he calls it. It's the stuff of the material. It's a prejudice. Right? Then we can see through the big blue bowl of the sky and into the eternity beyond. The choice between idolatry and faith, which is ultimately the choice between slavery in the flesh and freedom in the spirit, is the only real choice we have to make. And at the center of the center of this spiritual most real thing is love himself. Let me close my um, reading it to you this way. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. Isn't that what the passage says? Let me put it to you this way. Jesus is patient and kind to you and to me. Jesus does not envy or boast. Isn't that just absurd to think that Jesus is envious or boasts? Jesus is not arrogant or rude. He does not insist on his own way. And he is not irritable or resentful. If you ever think that when you're praying to Jesus and you have a picture of him of being irritated at you and resentful toward you, you don't have the right picture of Jesus. Jesus does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. In fact, he goes to the cross to put away wrongdoing. So the truth can come to you. And Jesus lowers himself. Of course he's not arrogant. He lowered himself to a manger. He humiliated himself on a cross. So you and I wouldn't be lonely. Jesus bears all things in you. He believes in you. He hopes all things. He endures all things. And his love never ends. This is God. This is the center of Christianity. This is what we believe. It's the gospel. And it has to be shared. So let's love our friends. But before you love our friends, remember that this is the way we have been loved. That's the gospel.